next, uh, the next talk is uh, here we have James Osborne, who is coming from Berlin. He works for Google and he's going to tell us about accelerated mobile pages. Exactly. So thanks, guys. Um, very happy to be here. It's actually my first WordCamp. So, yeah, it's hopefully the first of many. So today I'm going to talk about user-first websites and, as you've just heard, accelerated mobile pages. Uh, the name, accelerated mobile pages, refers to AMP, and we've actually got rid of the name, so it's not really known as accelerated mobile pages anymore. It's more just AMP, because AMP isn't just for mobile. But we'll go into it in detail anyway. So I work in the content experience team at Google, and what we do is we just help, we build products and tools that help the web ecosystem. There's a separate team for apps, they're growing hugely. So we really try to focus on the web and just different developments with web just to improve the overall ecosystem. Uh, one of the biggest focuses on the team I work in is WordPress. Obviously being the most popular CMS and Google didn't really come so much on board previously with plugins. There's a couple of new plugins now. There's Sidekit, there's AMP, which isn't really new, uh, PWA. So AMP and Sidekit in particular, I work with the team that developed <coughs> those plugins. So just to talk about user-first websites, it's a web development strategy that puts users at the forefront of the design process. A, user's, users, a user experience isn't always what comes first when people are considering a website. And uh, we'll just see on the next slide here. The website should be fast and reliable. All websites should load quickly with reliable runtime. All websites should also be secure. And visitors to your website should feel safe. A secure website using HTTPS also encourages trust and good brand identity for the users of your website. And websites should also be engaging. En engaging websites are what make your visitors come back. Engaging websites improve your bounce rate and overall experience. And also websites that are integrated into devices that users are using can really help you as website owners or developers. So if you're building a website, bear in mind not all your audience are using a top class smartphone. They're not all located in places with typically high broadband. So websites should be integrated to cover for all these circumstances. So typically stakeholders when building a website, they don't always have the user experience first in mind. So web designers, they might want to make super cool websites that lots of JavaScript effects just to make it look good. Marketers might want pop-ups and social media, not sure enough, they want to make sure people engage them off their website as well. And site owners might want to encourage more clicks and more visits to their website. So discussion, discussions when building a website don't always involve end users or they don't always take into factor the problems that end users face. And when you're considering building a website, you need to think about these things. Where are your audience based? Do you have a global audience? Should you, should you be using a content delivery network? How are they accessing your website? Is most of your traffic on mobile? Is it on desktop? Is it on iPads? And what's the experience? Do you have a, these days, most websites have a cookie notice. At the same time, some websites have a pop-up to allow them to add to home screen. And some of them have other pop-ups as well. So sometimes when you visit a website on mobile, there could be three or four clicks before people can actually read the content that they want to go to. Also, is a website accessible? Websites should be properly coded with all the, new tag, all the new HTML tags just to make it more accessible, which would bring in a new audience to your website as well. So accessible websites just bring an audience that have, for example, people who might be hard of seeing or hard of hearing. Accessible websites cover, just make it a lot more accessible for those type of people. Structured data too. There's not enough effort put into structured data on a lot of websites these days. And in WordPress in particular, it's, there's plugins that can help you with structured data. Themes as well should be playing their part in the ecosystem to make sure that their themes are compatible and using structured data just to make it easy for you as website u WordPress users. So this brings us to AMP, which is a, it's a web components framework 
and just designed to help, build, help you build user-first websites. It brings in all the top software engineering best practices, and has lots of really cool tools built in. Lazy loading is built in, uh, the CSS restri restrictions that just help with performance, and also JavaScript limitations, which it might be one of the, people might think it's a drawback that JavaScript is restricted in AMP, but actually JavaScript is, contributes to the biggest problems when it comes to website performance. So as I mentioned too, AMP isn't just for mobile. So it's considered AMP now because a lot of websites are using AMP on desktop also. So AMP is built for the open web. It's built just using traditional web, web coding languages. Uh, HTML, so AMP HTML, AMP itself is a subset of HTML. So you have in typical HTML, you might have an image tag. In AMP, it's just an AMP dash image. So it's not that difficult to learn basic AMP HTML. And in relation to JavaScript, AMP has lots of different components and features. AMP has actually built JavaScript in the back end, and all the components are also built with JavaScript. So when you're considering features for your website, or if, you're a, if you own a web development agency, you don't need to know as much JavaScript as you would previously. All these components come ready-made. They're carousels, they're slideshows, they're sidebars. So when people say, oh, I can't use JavaScript in AMP, there's lots of different components that you can easily use, and you just need to style. So from talking with developers before, they're able to hire people and train them up really, really good because these developers don't need to put as much emphasis on JavaScript. CSS too, uh, CSS works perfectly well in AMP, and it's just a way to, lots of people use CSS to style the different JavaScript components. So the user experience in AMP is it's vastly, vastly improved. There's lots of benefits AMP have over, an AMP website has over a non-AMP website. So AMP is all about speed. Websites are always instant loading. Websites are also served from AMP Cache where possible. So I'm not sure if you're familiar with AMP Cache, but it works very similar to a content delivery network. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Also in AMP, all content is lazy loaded by default. So I'm sure many of you are aware of what lazy loaded is, but basically content is loaded when needed. Also there's restricted JavaScript. In CSS there's no in inline styling. And all content is statically defined so if you're using an iframe or lots of other features, to render the page, it takes, it's much faster because there's less calculations before the page loads. Also, all, all elements and AMP components, they're loaded asynchronously. So there's no waiting for each different feature to load. And visitors to an AMP website also, they experience consistent and expected functionality. There's no, there's no lag when you're sliding through web, a website on your phone or there's no delay. And secure, security and stability is a feature in AMP as well. It's one of the biggest features in AMP. So if you have an iframe in AMP, which would be an AMP iframe, all the content is sandboxed, so it doesn't impact on the loading of the original website. So AMP brings lots of site owner benefits. Uh, there's less server resources required because uh, initial loads to the website from organic search are served by, from AMP cache. So your server's not being hit with all these visits. So if you have a really popular website, you're thinking, well, I might have to upgrade my server. With AMP, there's less of a need for that because it's been served from AMP cache. Also, you can get featured on, on the top stories carousel in Google News. And there's lots of other platforms that you might not be aware of, but they, they prioritize AMP content over regular content. If you have apps like Flipboard, Smart News, all these platforms just they, they put AMP content on top of traditional content. Uh, there's a collection of ready-to-go components. So as I mentioned, there's no need to hire expensive JavaScript developers to, if you're looking for a particular functionality. You could look at what functionality exists in the existing components, style them or change them to suit your own needs. And st security and stability also for site owners, it's just a big, big plus with AMP over traditional on website. And AMP websites too, while they don't have to be HTTPS, some functionality might not work. So it's always encouraged, all websites these days should be secure anyway. 
And also, if you're a news publisher or you're using ads, AMP ads work much faster and much better than traditional ads. They don't use JavaScript, they're not depending on third-party ad servers and ad networks, and they just perform much better. And my previous role in Google, I used to work with a lot of publishers, and a lot of those publishers, they might not be ready to go AMP just yet, but they do start implementing AMP ads over regular ads, which is perfectly possible. So AMP Cache, I'll talk briefly about AMP Cache. Does anyone know what a content delivery network is? Yes. Yeah, so you know what it is. So content delivery network, for those who don't know, it means it's a network of computer, like a servers across the world. And if you're using a content delivery network like Amazon Web Services or Cloudflare, your website is stored in all those servers across the world. So traditionally, if you've a, you buy a web host here in Glasgow, someone accessing that website in Sydney, it might take a lot longer to load than it would here in Glasgow. If you're using a content delivery network, that website would be served from the closest delivery point. So it could be served from Sydney. So that's just one advantage of a content delivery network. And AmpCache works similar to a content delivery network. If you do a search on your phone for mobile, do a search for latest news here in Glasgow, you'll see a little AMP signal. When you click on any of those, it's been served from AmpCache. So you'll always look for a little AMP icon you might not be aware of. Usually it's in the image. That's been served from AMP Cache. And any follow-on clicks are being served from the website origin. So that's why it's a little bit different to a traditional CDN, which you would pay for. So AMP Cache, just initially, initial load is served from AMP Cache. Uh, Google, Cloudflare, Bing, and lots of other providers host AMP Cache servers. So you might not be aware, but you're accessing your website, a cached version of your website on Bing servers, on Google servers, on Cloudflare servers. So one of the pushbacks we get about AMP is, oh, my content is Google control all my content. Lots of different providers support AMP Cache. And it's, a, it's just a way for improving visitors' experience to your website. So as I mentioned, this, the initial load is served from AMP Cache. Works similar to a CDN. And it's also particularly useful if your audience is global. So AMP components, ready-made JavaScript components and functionality, ready to go for your website. I won't go into too much detail. There's, I don't know how many, there's probably a couple of hundred of different components. So whatever you're looking for, whether you want to geo-block some content, whether you want a nice navigation menu, there's components for all these features. And it just makes it super easy to develop a website that's user as, is at the forefront. AMP bind, this one in particular, it's a way to get around JavaScript limitations. So if you want to toggle classes, which would traditionally be done with jQuery or JavaScript, AmpBind is a really useful component to kind of get around that limitation without any performance impact. And just going back to components also, if you go on the amp.dev website, which is the whole project website, you can test out these components. So it's really useful just to test them out and you can configure them as well. So before going live and putting them on your own website, you can just configure these components and see, well, that's going to fit in well with my WordPress website. And as you know, at Gutenberg as well, you could make a reusable block for those components. So that brings us to AMP with Gutenberg. So AMP has support for all the different building blocks if you're using Gutenberg. It also has enhanced image support. If you have an AMP website, images are all, ha already have the light box effect. You can click on them on any website, you'll see they pop up in a nice model window. It also has native WordPress support for embeds and shortcodes when you're using AMP. So has anyone used the official AMP plugin? You have? So how did you find the experience? Well, I installed it yesterday or the day before. Okay. Like, uh, something I'm just okay, well that's, I suppose that's... that's uh, and I guess the first thing was like, you search for AMP and there's like multiple different possibilities, some with higher... Uh, exactly. Ratings and less yeah. ratings. And there's different amp. plugins, yeah. And like you said, there's, um, there's all sorts of different ratings. So, yeah, I found it fine, fine but obviously I didn't have the opportunity to see it. It's really test it, yeah. Or, yeah, well, I suppose that's why I'm here, and I'm not going to go into too much technically about the plugin, but I'm going to talk about the official AMP plugin. So, Automatic were on board early on in the initial releases of the plugin. And now there's quite a few different developers, and um, lots of the ones I work with at Google. Yeah. Is there another option without using the plugin? Is it just the it's going to be a lot harder. Um, I don't see much examples of people using AMP without a plugin because the way 
I suppose just the way with WordPress you have your back end and your front end. AMP works in the back end really. Most of the work with can the you install it, can you install it on your box and test it? You certainly could, but I'd just recommend using a staging site, install the plugin. I wouldn't recommend especially if you're using a CMS like WordPress, I wouldn't recommend trying to do AMP without a plugin. Just Exactly, so that's what, um, yeah, so this plugin, and you might see, like you said, you saw all different types of review, reviews. So lots of the poor, the worst reviews are for the early stage of the plugin, when we didn't have different modes. So we'll go into it now. Um, you see here, just a brief image of the different modes. So this one, reader mode, initially this was called classic mode, and this was the only different mode of the AMP plugin. And that's why people were saying, AMP, I don't think it's for me. It doesn't look as well as I'd like it. So since last year, there's been transitional and standard mode. So reader mode, we'll go into the different modes in a minute, but reader mode is basically for websites that are using themes, WordPress sites that are using themes which aren't compatible. So you'll see here, the main use is non-compatible themes. Uh, you might not be aware, but the Sun, the Metro, UK, they're all WordPress websites. They're all using the official AMP plugin, and they're using it in reader mode. Reader mode isn't the best example of AMP, because it's not, it doesn't use your existing WordPress theme. So you don't really, it's not the best, it's not ideal to have your AMP website and your non-AMP looking different. So that's why reader mode exists just for themes that aren't compatible. Um, so the Metro and the Sun, they've customized the reader mode. It looks a little bit different. They've added navigation menus. And when you, when you do a search for any of their content on mobile, you'll be directed to an AMP website. You might not be aware you're on an AMP website, but you are. The appearance has a basic look and feel because it needs to, be, it needs to support themes that aren't compatible. It's detached from your existing WordPress theme. Also, there's error handling, which is a feature of the official AMP plugin. And all invalid content, whether it's JavaScript functionality, it's automatically stripped out so you don't have to debug or try to fix problems that don't work in AMP. Also for content type, it's only for individual pages and posts. So if you have widgets or your homepage shows lots of different blog entries, that's not going to have an AMP version. And the reason being is kind of want to move people away from reader mode to using an AMP compatible theme or using transitional or standard mode. And to access an AMP website or URL structure, you just need to type in forward slash question mark AMP at the end. But I'll go into, before the end of the slideshow, I'll show you easily how to identify if you're on a, an AMP website and to test out how other people have implemented AMP. So transitional mode, you'll see here an example of a couple of sites using AMP in transitional mode. So if you have a developer on board, are you able to fix any incompatible themes? Or preferably if you're using a compatible theme, such as any of the Genesis framework themes, the core WordPress themes, and newspaper, generate press. There's lots of themes that work in AMP perfectly well. And transitional mode or standard mode are the modes you'd want to be going for. With transitional, you have your typical non-AMP website like you normally would, but you also have an AMP version for each page, posts, any type of taxonomy. So yes, you have your AMP and non-AMP running alongside each other. And the reason being you're in transitional and not fully AMP, it might sound confusing, but you might have some pages on your website that you need to work, you need JavaScript functionality for some parts of your website. And that's why you might go transitional until you're ready to go 100% AMP. And as I mentioned, you wouldn't identify if you're on a transitional mode AMP website or not because they look and they work the same. So the appearance, it uses your existing WordPress theme. It has error reporting, and one of the really good features about the official AMP plugin, it tells you everything that's not going to work in AMP, and it allows you to keep that functionality or remove that functionality. Preferably, you remove that functionality and find an AMP valid replacement, whether it's a component we just men mentioned, or whether it's a plugin. So if you're using a forms plugin, for example, some forms plugins might not work in AMP, and that's the reason you might use transitional. You need to find a replacement, or you need to find Something that some form that will work in AMP. Sorry, how do you make AMP compliant? So the plugin that has a validation tool that kind of does all the hard work for you. So you, if you develop a plugin and then you just send it to the AMP site. And well, if you're developing a plugin, you can also you're developing it with a staging WordPress website or something locally. So if you're using the official plugin, it's really useful because when you're developing your own plugin, 
It will tell you all the non-AMP valid features of your plugin. So you can fix that and you can use the AMP bind component or find workarounds. So, and it's great, the more, the more AMP compatible plugins, the faster the ecosystem grows. Because we don't want, especially non-developers, having problems with AMP websites and still using reader mode. So the more plugins that are made AMP compatible, the more developers make, the faster developers make their themes and plugins AMP compatible, it can really be benefit them as well. Because one of the things I see, some, I used to talk with publishers and they weren't ready to go AMP because they're having a slideshow or some features that just won't work in AMP. So, but that goes, brings us on to the themes and the ecosystem. Never increasing collection of AMP file themes. Newspack and all new modern themes that built WordPress best standards, they're usually compatible. But always check first or just ask the developer. And if you're not a developer yourself, it's always worth asking the plugin or theme developer, do you intend on making the AMP compatible? So standard mode is an AMP first approach. It uses your existing WordPress theme and you don't have an AMP website running alongside a non-AMP website. The website is 100% AMP. Loads super fast. AMP is all about speed and performance improvements. And yeah, your AMP is first by default. You won't have a, you won't have, at the end of a URL, you won't have a forward slash AMP. So it's hard to identify if you're on a web, AMP website. Error reporting using the validation tool as well. By default, it removes all validation errors, but you can of course choose, you need to keep some of that functionality that doesn't work in AMP. The only thing is that, that page that has that functionality won't be AMP valid, which is fine. You're still using an AMP website, you still have all your other, all your other URLs are AMP. And it's AMP by default, only one version of your website. So here you'll see what the validation tool looks like. So you were saying you're building plugins, it would list all the invalid attributes of that plugin and it'll tell you exactly the function or the different aspects that don't work in AMP. So you can kind of work with it that way. Uh, there's two different features to the validation tool. There's a URL index and error index. And a lot of people, like if you've tested it and you see it's showing 100 errors, those 100 errors might relate to just one plugin. And doesn't mean that, certainly doesn't mean that plugin's built bad, but it means that, that plugin has, is appearing on 100 URLs on your website. So it might look frightening, but really it could just be one quick fix or one plugin. So it has live error reporting in the admin, in the, ad, in the dashboard, and it pinpoints the offending plugin or content. It also provides a link to that exact code or function, so you can see, or if you're a developer, you can debug. And also, you also have the option to remove or keep all these validation errors. You have to get all those errors for it to work. For it to be a 100% valid AMP document, yes. Mm -hmm. You can still have an AMP website, but unless it's 100% valid, it won't be served from AMP cache and you won't get all the features, all the benefits that AMP brings. And you, it'll, it'll still load, the website will still load, it just won't be 100% AMP valid. Well, I'm saying if it's affecting just one plugin, you need that plugin, but, but all the other plugins will be AMP compliant. It depends. You might have 20 plugins on your WordPress website. Five of them might not work in AMP. So an AMP only really is if on the front end, it, it, AMP, if there's any errors on the front end, like plugins such as SEO plugins, you won't, it's unlikely you'll find any validation errors with them. I use Yoast on some of my websites. It's fine. Um, rank math. So you won't see validation errors for plugins that operate in the back end. So it's just front-end features, really. Slideshows are stuff that appears in the front-end. And the reason AMP came about was all about performance, improving performance, so usually that's due to the front-end. Whatever happens in the dashboard is no problem. So AMP, it's all about page speed, and I don't know if you're familiar with Lighthouse technology. It's page speed insights is built with Lighthouse technology. And if you use Chrome DevTools, there's a little feature within DevTools. In the Audit tab, you can do a speed test on your website. So if you do implement AMP, always perform a speed test. You don't have to go to web.dev or any off-site websites. You can do it within Chrome, and it's Lighthouse technology built into Chrome. So it's much easier than you think to implement AMP. If you're using compatible themes, if you're using compatible plugins, chances are you're not going to fall into any development issues or look for help. There's lots of themes, lots of plugins out there, so it's just have that mindset if you're thinking about revamping your website or you're thinking about building a new website. If it can be AMP, why not 
make a BM. It's going to be much faster. You're going to get the use of almost a free CDN. Uh, you're going to get prioritized content on Google News. You're going to get prioritized content on lots of apps like Flipboard. So if it's possible to go AMP, why not? There's no reason not to use AMP. And if there is myths about AMP as well, I'm sure some of you might have heard, so feel free to ask me. Uh, I'll go through a couple of them as well at the end. And, and the components are brilliant. You really don't need to use as much plugins or spend time making your own jQuery or JavaScript features. They're free to use and just test them. With the amp.dev, the playground feature, is just, it's really good for using accordions and stuff like that. So who's using AMP? Uh, there's the little icon, there's the AMP icon in general. When you do a search on your mobile in particular, you'll see the little AMP icon. You're always landing on an AMP page. Uh, you might not be aware of it, but it's a quick way of using it. The AMP validator is a plugin. It's a Chrome extension, not a plugin. So if you have the Chrome extension AMP validator, really useful because when you visit a website, you'll know by the color of the icon whether you have it there actually. So that one. AMP icon. When you're, on, when you're on an AMP website, that'll be green. You can even click on it to see any debug errors or... It's just really useful when you visit a website to be aware of whether you're on your AMP website. And all news publishers are using AMP. If you go onto the BBC, The Guardian, it's very unlikely any news publisher or any big player is not using AMP. It's just you might not be aware of it. But if you use the AMP validator, it's just really cool for testing who's using AMP. So AMP Stories, uh, I'll just briefly run over AMP Stories because it does tie in with user-first websites. I'm sure you're all familiar with Instagram, Snapchat. So AMP Stories, um, AMP Email, there are extensions to the AMP project. AMP Stories is an open web version of building these stories. And different, the difference with AMP Stories compared to Instagram Stories is you own the content, you can monetize the content. They're built with just HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and yeah, the, the stories don't expire. They're just a URL within your own website. You can import them, you can export them. And people say sometimes, why would I use an AMP story? But if you have a typical post or a blog post and you want to engage a new audience who don't like reading too much, um, you could have, just underneath the title, you could have, read this in story format. So people can just swipe through on their phone, uh, look at the images, read the text on each story, just in the same way as Instagram but it's a URL within your website. So people can either read your content or just read it and digest it in story format. And also, there's going to be, we're working hard on a feature in, in Google search as well. There's going to be all visual stories as well, same way as you'd see in images or videos. And it's just going to highlight all the different stories available out there. So it's a good time to learn about AMP stories as well. And with the official plugin, at the moment there's a beta version of stories it's baked into the existing AMP plugin. It's eventually going to be its own AMP Stories plugin for WordPress, but it's built using the Gutenberg way. So if you're familiar with using building blocks, it's worth testing out Stories. Um, lots of people are already using it, but just uh, for a future-proof way of engaging a new audience, AMP Stories could be really useful. So if you have any questions, I'll just go through, feel free to ask. I'll go through a few, the most common questions I get daily dealing with publishers or at events. So how and how, how would I use AMP Stories on my website? So like I just mentioned, below the title or maybe as the first paragraph, view this blog post in story format. You'll be surprised how well it works. And because you control the monetization, you can put ads in those stories, there are limitations, but you could also put analytics and track how many people have clicked that button, how many people have read that story. And as well as that, the stories don't expire. So you make a nice story of the event here today that the guy has done a great job of. It doesn't expire. Next year you can go back and see, just swipe through, see how the day went. So if you're writing a blog post, just test out the stories. How do the AMP stories compare with things like the TikToks and stuff like that then? Or do uh, well, it? I suppose TikTok's more about video. Stories kind of, it's a way to, it hold, generally most people host them on your own website and they tie in with whether you create a new blog post. TikTok is more about videos, and TikTok is great, but at the same time, they control everything on that platform. When you make an AMP store, you can export that into a zip file, and it's just HTML, CSS, JavaScript. So it's completely different, it's open web, and it doesn't have any of the limitations of Instagram stories, YouTube stories, so lots of the, it's just the open web way that you control your own story, and it doesn't expire. Lots of people also say, does, does implementing AMP, does it affect my SEO? So the short answer to that is no. 
It's not going to help your SEO. It's not going to hinder your SEO. But one thing I always tell people is, if you go 100% AMP, it means your website is going to be super fast by default. And speed is a factor in Google search and rankings. So if you do go 100% AMP, it can give you a boost. But AMP on its own, if you have AMP running alongside non-AMP, it's your non-AMP website that is the one that's considered for indexing. So don't think as you have reader mode or transitional mode, you're going to get a boost in Google search because it's not, it's not going to give you that boost. So we touched on validation errors. What options do I have? What can I do if I see a lot of validation errors on AMP? So you can use components in place of plugins. Preferably keep using your plugins. So talk with the developers or if you're able to debug any of the errors because AMP bind and lots of other components can help you with any JavaScript errors. So yeah, there's lots of ways to get around validation errors. Debug yourself, contact the developer, or use an AMP component instead, if possible. Uh, some resources I like to share. AMP.dev is the AMP project website. The playground is where you can test out lots of the different components, how it might fit in with your website. If you want an FAQ style, with, you want FAQs in your website in a nice accordion style, there's components that do that. AMP-WP.org, it's a plug-in website. If you, build your own, if you build your own AMP website, you can submit your own website for inclusion. So feel free to submit your own site. And web.dev, it's just a way of comparing performance. So if you don't want to use Chrome DevTools and the Lighthouse, Lighthouse technology built in with DevTools, you can use web.dev. It's just an easy way to test website performance. So always test the, when you create a website, compare the performance. And also bear in mind, your performance will be increased even further when it's served, when your content is served from AMP cache. So there is a difference in AMP cache and AMP by origin. So, and I don't have a link here because it's a Chrome extension, but definitely check out the AMP validator Chrome extension. It just <coughs> identifies when you're on an AMP website. And also it will list, and for your own website, it will list any validation errors and there's a debugging feature of the Chrome extension as well. There's no extension on Firefox or any other browsers, is it? Well, I'm not sure actually, I don't use Firefox too much just for development, but I'm not sure there might be. Uh, just last slide I'm going to talk about, SiteKit is another plugin we've worked hard in. Um, we released it late last year, and it just builds lots of different Google products. Search Console, Analytics, AdSense, PageSpeed Insights, Tag Manager, and Optimize, all into one WordPress plugin. Uh, have any of you used SiteKit? No? Oh, you have, yeah. So you'll find it, how do you find it before I? Yeah, it's good, it's nice and easy to use. Yeah, yeah it's, so, uh, it's good. Exactly, and, and if you have a WordPress website, it's, it's something we've worked really hard on, but I'm going, obviously I'm biased, but it's a great plugin. You don't need to go to search consoles to submit your website. You don't need to go to analytics, even AdSense. It, it can submit your website for inclusion on the AdSense network. And all within the same dashboard, you can see how many visitors you've had over the last seven days areas of improvement, you can check your page speed, so it's a really cool plugin, and like I said, I might be biased, but feel free to give it a try, uh, Sidekit, and that's more or less it, Do you, I'm sure some of you have questions, this is, AMP is a, yeah, so, thank you. Well, the good thing about the official AMP plugin, it converts, uh, when you talk about the different tags, it's AMP HTML that has its own like image, AMP image. So you don't need to do anything to make your, if there's validation errors, certainly fix the validation errors. But the AMP plugin converts, if you have, if your plugin has features that end up on a user's front end HTML, the AMP plugin converts all regular HTML into AMP HTML. So the plugin does all the hard work. So it's just if you have JavaScript or other features, you might need uh, to use AMP bind or a workaround just to fall back for AMP. But generally, if it's just some features that add some HTML in front end of your website, you won't need to worry. But if you install the plugin and test the validation tools, to test the validation feature of the plugin, it will tell you. So, and it is worth it because 
people are out there looking for non-developers might be looking for plugins and because they're using plugins that don't work in AMP so it's a good time to maybe make especially for a developer it might be super easy to make your plugin AMP compatible and it could be bringing new audience who are looking for that feature so Uh, good question. It goes stale after, I think, it's really, it's, it works differently than a regular cache. So basically, if you visit an AMP website, it's cached again. So this, whoever visits the website after you, it's constantly being re refreshed. So it's, exactly. So it's very unlikely you access a website that's, that's not going to be up to date. It's very unlikely. And at the same time, even if you don't get much traffic, I can't remember the exact refresh periods before it goes stale and it's, it's fetched again, but it's on, the, it's on the Google developer website, yeah. Any more questions, no? Okay, so test out the AMP plugin. And like I said, just as a wrap up, if you are using, especially a WordPress core theme or themes that support AMP, there's no reason why you shouldn't be using AMP. Even if it's in transitional mode, just compare the difference because it can make a difference. Speed is a factor and there's lots, of, there's lots of benefits of AMP. So if you can use AMP, there's no reason not to use it. Okay?